Business management established in 2011 as one of bachelor programs at Institute Technology 10 November, Surabaya. Our department became part of faculty of creative design and digital business. Business management ITS is a unique management major which combines management science with ITS identity as an engineering campus. Students will gain technical skills and soft skills to prepare themselves as future business leaders. There are four concentrations in business management of ITS, which are Operation Management and Business Analytics, Marketing and Entrepreneurship, Human Resource Management, and also Accounting and Finance. To familiarize students with real business circumstances, our department offers some project-based courses such as Design Thinking, New Venture Creation, Sociopreneurship, Business Consulting Project, Internship, and many others. Business Management ITS offers International Undergraduate Program or IUP for both Indonesian and foreign students. Students will get lectures fully in English and have greater opportunities to take part in international mobility. Our department offers double degree programs. Our double degree programs are held in collaboration with the University of Queensland and Rand School of Business. Students will study at ITS and partner universities to get two undergraduate degrees. We provide students the opportunities to take international mobility such as exchange program, short course programs, international internships and study excursion foreign students are welcome to our department to experience study life in ITS while enjoying the beauty of Indonesia. To support those activities, Business Management ITS has several international partners. There are two laboratories to promote research at Business Management ITS. Business Analytic and Strategy Laboratory and Entrepreneurship and Small Medium Enterprise Laboratory. Business Analytic and Strategy or BAS focuses on Operations Management, Strategic Management, accounting and finance entrepreneurship and small medium enterprise or ESME focuses on marketing entrepreneurship human resource management performance measurement and data and development analysis 
our department have more than 500 alumni. They work at different fields and industries such as banking and finance, national and multinational companies, government institutions, and even became an entrepreneur. Let's join Business Management ITS and trust your journey with us to be the future business leaders. Unstructured data is created by individuals, business, or sensors every second of the day. Estimates indicate that 80% of the data available in the world today is in unstructured format. For example, from social media. This is a phenomenal change in how we analyze and use data in decision making. Businesses and governments have recognized the potential of this unprecedented availability of unstructured data to improve decision making and operations, as can be seen by the increase in investment in building social media analytics capabilities. So in this session, Dr. Morteza Namfar will explore the social media analytics and its role in making sense of the vast amount of unstructured data collected during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, hello, Dr. Merza, how are you? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, I'm very well. I'm so excited to, to be with you guys. And yeah, uh, I was amazed with your beautiful campus and also your beautiful country. And I look forward to be there yeah, soon, hopefully soon after the pandemic. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we hope to, uh, Dr. Morteza. So before that, I will uh, introduce Dr. Morteza first. So currently, Dr. Morteza is an assistant professor in business information system and analytics at the University of Queensland, Brisbane. So his research interests are in the areas business analytics, social media analytics, and blockchain technologies. So his articles have been published in several journals and peer reviewed conference proceedings. He also has served as associate editor at several journals and as also as a tractor in ASIS and as a reviewer for various international journals. So without waiting too long, so I think Dr. Morza, it's the time is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello again, everyone, uh, and thanks, thanks for the, the great attendance. It's uh, really an honor for me to talk about what we do in University of Queensland and talk about my research, my teaching, my student, the future now. And I guess uh, what I have in my mind, and this morning I was thinking about it, is too much, and I tried to uh, and I'm, I'm excited about it because it's my passion, it's my research interest, it's my teaching interest. And I'm, I'm glad that I have the chance to talk to students uh, from overseas, especially Indonesia. I have had uh, some um, uh, PhD fellow from Indonesia, brilliant guy, very nice, and uh, students from Indonesia. And I, I always believe that international students uh, especially those who, for example, uh, migrate to other countries, they always uh, ready to put uh, um, as, as much as effort needed to be the top students. And we can see here uh, that uh, how good uh, a student from lots of, I guess, uh, overseas countries, especially Indonesia, in uh, doing very well in Australia. And I hope one day, uh, I see some of you in the University of Queensland and I find the opportunity to talk to you face uh, to face and we have some uh, fruitful collaboration. So uh, yeah, I'm um, an assistant professor or as we call it in Australia, a lecturer in business analytics and I joined the University of Queensland in 2019. Uh, I have been teaching business analytics um, since 2016 when I was a lecturer at Deakin University. And I have uh, about 10 years of experience of uh, working with data in my PhD, before my PhD in industry, 
and now in the University of Queensland and now also working in the industry in different projects. So I try to share my experience and I try to uh, motivate you and I let you know what is available and what are the opportunities and what we do about those opportunities. So let's uh, get started. Uh, I have provided the, the links to my uh, YouTube profile and my LinkedIn. Um, I guess the best way to contact me is LinkedIn. Uh, emails can get changed, but uh, usually LinkedIn profile uh, stays contacts, uh, constant. Who knows, maybe next year I'm a lecturer in your university or another university, but uh, it's good to stay in touch. And if you needed me, you can reach me via my email or via LinkedIn. So I'm going to, because uh, I really don't know uh, what is the background of uh, the attendees, I'm going to start with an overview of business analytics and also talk about what we do here. Talk about the journey from data to knowledge and then talk about a little bit of complex data sources. Um, and then after talking about those complex data sources, I'm going to talk about text analytics and related somehow to the, some of the project that we have uh, related to COVID-19 and then talk about the future of our students. So uh, uh, I guess uh, most of you probably know the importance of data. Usually uh, when I want to start talking a business analytics course or a presentation, I ask my student or the attendees, okay, who knows 100 years ago or 200 years ago, what was the competitive advantage? And some of them come with the right answer, but some of them don't know. But uh, because um, uh, it's hard to make it interactive over Zoom, I, I don't wait for the responses, but um, I go to the answer. I guess uh, we have seen all in the movies and in the books that 200, 300 years ago, the land was competitive advantage, who had uh, the biggest lands was the richest. And then uh, we moved to industrial revolution and then factories became uh, become really, really important. And then Europe could uh, took over and Europe could really uh, advance in everything because they had really, really good factories and productive and they could export to all over the world. And then the next revolution was in data when uh, people realized what is hidden in the data is important and many different roles uh, were created. People started talking about data, what we can do with data. And then uh, they called data lifeblood or the new oil, lots of different terminologies. And it's not, it's not just exaggeration. Look at the top companies in world. What they do is working on data. Probably most of you know uh, the, uh, the value of WhatsApp when it was bought by Facebook. What, WhatsApp had probably less than 50, or I don't know, remember the exact number, but very low number of employees. But the amount that Facebook was happy to pay for that was really crazy. And it's because they know how to work with data. And the fact that we have something that is very intellectual and people can basically uh, use their brain to work with data. And it makes us to get rid of all those limitation of uh, need for financial asset. That's a really, really positive point, especially for, mm -hmm. uh, for people in, less wealthy countries, like my home, own home country or any other countries, I guess when we need less financial asset, we can be more creative and working with data is in that place. And then companies like Facebook, Microsoft and all other companies that you definitely know started working with data. So what we can do with data and what is available, that's the biggest question and what is the future? So let's, let's talk about uh, data and knowledge. And then from there, I want to um, get to the point that what we can do and what we are doing 
at the University of Queensland and in many other business analytics uh, uh, programs. Basically, uh, you walk in the street and you are sending data to everywhere. I guess all the apps that are in your installed in your mobile phone, your computer, they are collecting data from you and they are storing data, different applications, different companies. We don't have shortage for data. We say the world is rich in data, but poor in information. I guess that's the best way that I can describe the challenge and the opportunity. So we are collecting data, but we don't know yet fully how we can use this data to generate information and knowledge. And that's where our program sits. Basically, we try to teach our students to start from collecting data, creating a data warehouse, do data mining, and at the end, get to here to create knowledge. This is the pathway that we are creating for our students. And we try to teach them in each aspect what they can do. And the type of knowledge that they create is not a simple, I guess, data mining technique from structured data. We work with variety of tools and techniques that I talk about them one by one today. And I talk about uh, somehow a real world uh, project that we have. Please uh, feel free to ask me question when you want. Uh, so I usually keep going, but uh, I would love to have the session interactive if you have any question. So yeah, whenever you want to ask a question, just chat it or unmute yourself and let's make the session interactive. So usually I need to be honest with you guys. And I'm, I'm telling in most of my presentation, predictive analytics is not new. Some people try talk, uh, talking about business analytics, deep learning, predictive analytics, and then try to say that it's something new. But it's not new. It has been there. It has been there for at least 30 or 40 years. The book that I'm using to teach in the University of Queensland is a really old book. And all the techniques are borrowed from that book. So what has made business analytics very shiny and very interesting for industry is not the, the new techniques, it's the amount of data which is available. So the more data we have, the better we can use those techniques. So techniques are not new, only the way we collect data is new, okay? And then we have better hardware to process data. And if we can process data faster, then we can generate knowledge quicker. So, and we get to this top end, which is knowledge. Imagine that, okay, data was there, technique was there, but the hardware wasn't there. So you would have logged in in Facebook and Facebook wanted to send you a recommendation. So because the hardware wasn't as good as what they have right now, after you log out, after 10 hours, then probably you are sleeping and then Facebook sends you a recommendation. That's not useful, that can be silly because we don't need that anymore. What usually those social media or any business do, they do instant prediction, instant data mining and send you the recommendation straight away. And this is the power of fast processing. So again, to get to my initial point, we have techniques and we have had those techniques. So what is new is the amount of data that we collect and also the fast processors that we have. So all together has made the businesses think that, okay, if we have data and the technique has been there and we have the processors and we can create the knowledge. And before all those changes, companies used to have an expert sitting in the company with 30 years or 40 years of experience. And based on those experience, they could tell, okay, what is right to do and what is not right. 
But now we have other experts and those experts are your data mining techniques that can somehow create knowledge or extract pattern from data that hasn't been possible to understand without those techniques. Even those experts with years of experience in the companies couldn't dig those types of knowledge. But we have that opportunity right now. So what we do in our programs, usually we try to start from the foundation and the foundation and what we have had before predictive analytics was business intelligence. We try to distinguish between business intelligence and predictive analytics. Basically, business intelligence is a very broad term and it has data collection, data cleaning and everything. But when we talk about predictive analytics, we try to use the prepared data, the clean data, and then extract knowledge from that. So in the program that we have, we try to uh, have graduate that know business intelligence very well. And on top of that, they know how to extract knowledge and information from data. So basically, uh, we can say predictive analytics or business analytics is included in a business intelligence system, but it's not always the case. So there is not a must for business analytics to have business intelligence, but uh, basically if a company has a robust business intelligence system, then uh, they, they could have better predictive modeling and business analytics. So um, I, I'm using some terminologies. I, uh, some of you may be already familiar, and again, some of you may not be familiar at all. Uh, so just, again, feel free to ask questions if you don't know, for example, what is business intelligence. But because I want to get to the, the point that we have about text analytics, I, I try to assume that level of detail is enough for you guys. But yeah, feel free to ask questions. So in, in, the, in our program, and what we do in our program, basically, I guess, uh, is a standard level of business analytics. What we have, for example, in the University of Melbourne, in MIT, in Harvard, I guess we try to uh, teach a student to gain the skill from the whole spectrum. And the spectrum, start from data sources and data integration, creating data warehouse, giving access to data, and then application like predictive analytics on top of that. And you may, for those who don't have back, technical background, they may think, oh, there was lots of technical terms here. But what we do, we make the assumption that a student come with zero, absolutely zero technical background. So we get the business students and we teach them all those skills. Uh, I didn't have access or I, I didn't search enough to be honest. Probably you can search in, for example, Indonesia to see uh, how many jobs are available for analytics. I can't tell you about Australia all the industry sectors right now have position for data analysts, sales analysts, business analysts, I don't know, sales efficiency analysts, operation analysts, because the fact is we have collected data about different business operation. For example, about sales, about customers, about logistics. And those data are collected and now businesses have realized they need to analyze it. So they have created those positions. So you may think, okay, uh, what about the student from computer science? I, I would tell you, they are not your competitors because businesses, and I tell you in Australia with confidence, businesses and industry are looking for the student or the graduate that they understand business 
and then then they can apply they can apply their business understanding to data analysis okay this is a big advantage if you are in business school and you can learn to apply these techniques you have a big competitive advantage okay and we try we try to assume that a student come with zero technical background but at the end they know from a to z of course we don't want to develop programmers but we know if a student want to get a job in industry then they need to be able to get data from different data sources integrate data they need to be able to send queries to databases they need to create a data warehouse or even if they don't create a data warehouse they need to be able to work with the data warehouse usually in big companies they have an it team the it team take care of most of those uh, i guess heavy technical tasks like creating a data warehouse and then the, the data warehouse is ready for you guys and you work with that you send queries you type sql queries and that's what we teach you and then you can give access to data and that access again is is your competitive advantage because you know about business better so you can design dashboards okay the way that a business student can do that well not a comp a student with a with an engineering background i'm not saying they cannot they they definitely can have self study and learn it or they may have the talent natural talent but you learn that you learn that and they don't have the opportunity to learn that in their uh, study so uh you learn how to visualize data and how to get access to provide access to data to different business stakeholders and then you learn how to apply different predictive modeling techniques so this is the broad pictures of what we do and the skill set that we develop for students in australia we have this uh, energy saving i guess technologies and usually after 10 minutes if i don't move the the lights turn off so i need to move a little bit and turn it on again my apologies so yeah that's technology technology comes with uh, so many advantage but it's hard to consider all the details and that's one of them and definitely when you start working with data science you will you will you will feel that and you will be a victim of that in data science too so uh, i talked about uh, data sources and the importance of collecting different data uh, so when we talk about data many people think about excel spreadsheet and very clean data uh, which is good and still that's the main source of data it doesn't need to be in excel but i mean it's structured but we are getting enormous enormous sources of data which are not structured and that's that's the next move for businesses next big move and many of business, businesses have reached there uh i give you an example a few weeks ago i was contacted with a uh, with a colleague and he asked me that if we can develop a project for them and we conduct a project and that person is working in australian government and they said basically we have many uh, many hard copies of documents and we want to classify it and when you think about a government you can imagine how many papers and hard copies and claims are there from years and years if they want to classify it manually first of all it can be i guess um, very time consuming and also it can be i guess um, it can come with errors so basically what they wanted to do they wanted to use the new technology uh, from computer vision and deep learning 
and also cloud computing and to be able to use predictive analytics and classify the documents. So you see, from a picture, we are going to get to uh, predictive analytics. So, and, and you can see many, many different examples of that. And it's growing everywhere. If you ask me where we can apply it, I will tell you wherever you have data. In health sector, enormous application of predictive analytics. Government, mining, oil industry. And basically the reason is, again, data is coming from different sources. We can, when we, we, when we collect this data, then we can mine data. And mining data, usually um, it's, it's simple, but if you want to do data mining or create knowledge from data, in-depth knowledge is not really simple. Uh, we can have books, we can have sessions, we can have lots of courses. Uh, and I should be frank with you guys, you can never sit in any course and no one can promise you that you will learn everything. So uh, what you need to be, you need to be a good researcher. If you want to be a good data analyst or you want to be a good data scientist. And you know, uh, the, the terminology or the job role for data scientists and Initially, I was critical about data scientists. I was thinking, okay, why people say data scientists? A scientist is someone who works in the university and tries to create knowledge and that knowledge should be very, I guess, significant. I still, I'm still on that belief. I'm, I haven't fully changed. And I think uh, data scientists, for what we have in industry is wrong terminology. Uh, and I will talk about it more later. But if you want to know why we call some people in industry data scientists, because they need to always do research. They need to always um, find new techniques and what is available. And uh, the application that we have, and I will talk about them, the open source software and all of them are getting upgraded and upgraded and new tools come up. And if you want to uh, be good in this field, you need to always get updated. So if you see yourself a person who likes the challenge, that's, that's a good pass for you guys. But some people would like to learn something and use it for years and years without getting updated. This is not true about data science. And when we say data science, I'm thinking science part is because of lots of research which is needed, needed uh, for you to be good in this field for predictive analytics or for business analytics. I will talk about it. So. All in all, I wanted to say, okay, we have graph, we have social network, we have a special data, we have text data, and I will talk about text. We have data stream, we have uh, data from sensors, we have data from your mobile, and all of those type of data can be used for predictive analytics. So the more complex the data gets, the harder it is to analyze it. And if you get that role, more money you get. So that's the reality. So if, if you learn to work with a simple structured data, still it's good. Still, there are lots of opportunity, but of course, if you can um, work with, for example, computer vision, you can work with the graph and learn those things, maybe not in one course, let's say in four or five years, if you have zero background, start with a course in business analytics and then learn more, 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 and then become, and for example, machine learning engineer. I talk about those roles later in the slide. Uh, I pause myself to see if anyone has any question. Okay. 
Okay, students, so maybe some of you have questions, then you, you can raise hand directly. Okay, uh, Nathaniel, maybe you can open also your camera. Uh, okay, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Nathaniel uh, with student number 062. Uh, in your presentation, you said something about cloud computing. Uh, I want to ask uh, your opinion. Is cloud computing will be the future of data analytics considering the size of big data that getting bigger and bigger? Thank you. No. Nathaniel, th thanks for your question. That's, that's a good question. I, I would say it's not the future. It's, it's the present. It, it is the present, I guess. Uh, right now, and I talked about the job offer that I had, the project that uh, I was asked to work on government data. And one of their uh, specification was that they want to work in Microsoft Azure. So AWS Azure, they are already there. They do everything about predictive analytics. And my recommendation is if you want to get it started, definitely, definitely uh, learn about AWS Azure, there are lots of jobs available for those tools. And mm -hmm. there are lots of certificate that you can get. Um, if you already know about business analytics, I guess uh, getting those certificate are, are really uh, advantage. But if you don't know about business analytics, it's good to start with a course like what we offer or any other university. Um, but yeah, then Usually I haven't seen in the universities to uh, get to the level to, for example, uh, teach those cloud computing tools. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think for our student and our graduate to get updated to that level uh, and upgraded to that level, is not really hard. What we teach, uh, and I'm going to show you in this slide, what we teach our, our, our students is about application tools and techniques. And we try, we try to work on the foundations. The reason for that is uh, a student can get updated. They can learn new tools by themselves. But let's say uh, I start with the tools. Uh, even if, for example, we teach, for, let's say Python today, in five years, maybe Python is not uh, that that uh, popular. Maybe another tool, Orange, becomes popular. If we teach SAS Enterprise Miner, and I remember when I started uh, teaching uh, analytics, SAS Enterprise Miner was very popular. But now Python has taken over. Everyone tries to learn Python. Mm -hmm. And the future for Python is very optimistic. But what is important and our approach is that we try to teach analytics regardless of the tools. We try to focus on this part, techniques. And the reason is, and getting back to my early, uh, early slide that I said, okay, the technique has been there, that the new data is new and also the processors are better right now. What we do, we try to teach our student this foundation and this foundation, the left side, applications. So as a business student, you guys can understand what is customer relationship management and why it is important and what concepts we have in customer relation management. For example, customer acquisition, retention, churn, analysis, and then you can critically think how you can relate those techniques to those applications. You can understand what is a direct marketing campaign, what is cross-selling, what is clinical decision support as a business student. And we teach you those techniques and you make that mapping. And the platform for that mapping is the tools. And in, in the University of Queensland and for the rest of uh, lecture and presentation, I refer to that as UQ, as we do in Australia. In UQ, uh, UQ Business School, our emphasis is in Python for 
many reasons that I talk about it later. Uh, right now, Python for predictive analysis, analytics is the preference. Uh, yeah, so, but for you guys to, to be able to grasp those opportunities, you need to be able to understand the application, to know the techniques and to be able to implement on those techniques using those tools. And again, the way we teach, we try to uh, make your learning about the techniques independent from the tools so that migrating from one tool to another tool is easy. And even when you teach learn analytics, even if it's self-learning, I, I advise you guys to focus on the techniques because even if you are fully expert on, for example, SAS interpose minor, then you can get a job offer that and the, the new company is using Python. You cannot tell them that, okay, I'm good in SAS interpose minor and you need to buy SAS interpose minor license. You need to adapt yourself to their needs. So be, because of that, it's, uh, uh, my advice to you guys is that to understand the application words and to understand the techniques. And if you learn one, one tool good, uh, I promise you migrating to another tool is a piece of cake. So why the focus is on Python here. Uh, you may be familiar with open source concept. Basically Python and R are open source. Uh, and that open source brings many advantage. First, first advantage for um, co countries like Australia that they need to pay uh, a lot for uh, license. Uh, I guess that's cost saving, especially if you want to get a job in SMEs, a small medium enterprises, uh, it's, it's hard for them to, for example, to buy the license of expensive tools like uh, SAS Enterprise Miner or SPSS um, Modeler. So uh, that's the advantage of Python as an open source. And also because it's open source, uh, the company or the software uh, has many, many developers. So basically whatever you want is there basically because people from around the globe sit in their office, in their home, develop packages, develop functionalities for Python. And your job is just to search, find and amaze your employer or even if it's your for your research, do whatever you need. So that's the advantage of Python. Uh, you may say, okay, Python or R, I would say they are equally good, only the future of Python seems to be more bright because of its capabilities for machine learning and advanced techniques like deep learning and also its capabilities for programming. I guess the future for Python seems to be brighter and I guess if you want to pick one as a starter, I would advise Python and that's our approach here. Basically, when I joined University of Queensland in 2019, um, they used to teach our studio uh, in this subject. And I'm, I'm glad to say that I was the first person, as far as I know, in the University of Queensland who dared to teach Python to business students. So I, I, I broke the taboo uh, that uh, people were thinking or academic were thinking that uh, Python is too heavy for business students. So I have my students uh, that work with Python, they do amazing job. And basically their assignment is due on Monday. So they are working hard with Python and Again, they had zero technical background. Of course, if you have good technical background, uh, your learning is uh, faster and you can uh, do more amazing job, but there is no requirement for that. So yeah, um, and uh, I'm glad that after 
uh, I, I did make that biggest step then um, I guess in some other courses, people were motivated to teach Python in the business school, which is a good, um, uh, I guess, good uh, move. But again, look, uh, because I'm right now dealing with this issue, I understand that uh, it's open source and you need to understand it open, uh, what is open source. There is no support for them. Uh, everything is not neat, standardized. You can get many funny errors because nobody has been in charge. And it, 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 it is being developed by different people without supervision. And I guess that's the, that's the reality. That's the beauty and also that's the drawback. So if you need to, from the starting day, remember that uh, and you need to be prepared to deal with the errors, to be a good troubleshooter, to debug your program, and to uh, to be interested to read the error. And what that's the issue that I have with some of my students, I guess. Uh, they do, even don't read the error. They just, okay, I got the error, and that's the end of the world. So it's not the end of the world, I guess. You need to learn when you work with Python as open source or even R, I guess things are not as clear and as easy as I guess um, enterprise uh, software is like, for example, SAS and SPSS. Any question guys? So uh, the journey that we have for our students, and I recommend to you guys, uh, we usually try to make our students to understand and to be able to apply three concepts. Bas basically, they need to be able to understand what is data and what is database and how to work with database. This is important. And for you, for those who understand, know, have a little bit of background, uh, for that, the base uh, and the most popular tool is SQL, Microsoft SQL or MySQL. Basically, you need to learn a structured query language. And the next step is, okay, if we have different databases, how we can integrate them into data warehouse? And we call it business intelligence. Business intelligence is not about data warehouse. It's about data warehouse with the application on top of that. And basically the, I guess, classic definition of business intelligence is to give the right data to the right person to the, in the right format. And they call it, if you do that, if your company does that, it means that business intelligence is there. And then it's analytics. Analytics works, works hands in hands with business intelligence. Basically, if business intelligence is there, we can use analytics, we can do amazing job for digging knowledge or mining knowledge from vast amount of data that we have. Why text? The, one of the, I guess, emphasis that we have in our program is text. Uh, and again, I have been the person who basically try to justify it. And I guess, again, that, that's, I'm not saying it was only my idea in the business school, but I'm saying, I guess probably uh, I talked more about it and people were motivated. And uh, I guess right now in the business school is, it's, I guess the new trend to work with text data. Why text? Uh, in terms of application, 90% of the data in the world is right now text. You post in Facebook, social media, and right here and there, and your data is collected, it's text. So we need to be able to analyze it. That's one reason. Apart from that application side, text sits somewhere between a structured data and highly unstructured data. So text is not a structured, but it's not very complex. For example, like data that we can from 
from the camera, from sensors. We can have more complex data types too. Because of that, text is a good place to start with complex data sources. That's why we put text analytics in our courses. Basically, we start with a structured data and we say, okay, we need to understand something from text. We cannot disregard it. And that's the reality. Industry, companies have many, many different sources to collect sentiment or reviews or everything from the customers and they want to analyze it. And I get to there, uh, I talk about two real projects that my students are doing. So basically, overall, what we try to teach our students, and my advice to you guys, um, as business students, not only you need to be able to develop models, also you need to be able to assess your models. And also you need to be able to communicate your models. The beauty of the skill set of our graduate is that they sit in between business and IT. So at the end, they can talk to business people, they understand what they say, and the business people understand what they say. And also they have the technical skill set to talk to IT side. That was the issue before. Before we had IT and business. This guy knew business, but not very in depth. And this guy usually didn't know anything about IT, unless I guess very basic functions. So our new, our new graduate can make this, I guess, communication happen. And you need to position yourself like this. You need to be able to analyze real world problems and use uh, the outcome of business analytics to efficiently talk about the strategies. And that's what we try to teach our students. That said, our programs in the business school is not only focused on data side, also we talk about strategies for business, we talk about um, uh, monetizing, we talk, talk, talk about ethics and all the uh, non-technical issues and the requirement associated with business analytics. So um, I talked about text and about its importance. And you may not believe, and many of my colleagues cannot believe that unless they see that. And I have provided an evidence from you here. Look at these three guys, James Boyce, an Australian student, Jatin Sarna, an Indian student, Jen Young, a Chinese student, three of my students in my 2020 class. They did fantastic in their assignment. And I told them, okay, it's a waste if we leave it as it is. So I asked them to sit together and we publish their work as a paper in a very reputable conference. And unfortunately, the COVID things was that they couldn't travel to US to present their work, but we did that remotely. If you Google, this paper is right now there, and I have put the link for that. So, I mean, that's the level of depth of their learning. And honestly, I picked three of the students, but I could have picked even more, and I, we could have multiple papers, but basically I didn't have time to supervise them. I handholded them, but I gave them direction, I reviewed everything, and they were kind enough to ask me to put my name first, but I guess we equally worked on the paper. And basically the project that they did, and I briefly talk about the project, uh, and I gave them as an assignment, basically you write reviews in different platform. 
And in this case, it was Amazon. For example, you buy something from Amazon and you leave a review about the quality of product. And sometimes your, your review is helpful and sometimes it may not be helpful. For example, if you write a very detailed review, then um, it, it can be helpful. But if you say, okay, I didn't like it or terrible product, but you don't provide the details or the language or the wording. What we did in this paper, my student developed algorithm or developed methods to predict which review is helpful and which review is not helpful, okay? I'm not saying that's something that nobody has done it before. Many people have done it, but my, my student had a novel approach for doing that. And of course, Amazon itself has the techniques for doing that and many other platforms, but that's what my student did. Then the COVID happened and the beauty of our teaching in the UQBS or University of Queensland Business School is that we always try to work on the real world cases. I said, okay, we are facing COVID and all of us are affected. Why we, I don't develop an assignment on COVID data? So I have put the description of the assignment. As, I, as you can say, the due date is 7 June, 11 a.m., which means next Monday. And by the way, 7th of June is my birthday. So by chance, um, the due date is similar uh, at the same time of my birthday. So in my birthday, instead of getting happy birthday messages, I will get lots of a student, email from a student that, oh, my grandma, for example, unfortunately has passed away or my computer was, I guess, damaged and they asked for ex extension. So which is all right. Uh, we like uh, uh, those type of emails too. I guess that's the reality. We have been a students too. Uh, we have sent those emails too. We have sent those requests too. So that's all right. Uh, but yeah, that's my birthday story this year instead of happy birthday messages. So uh, what I did, I we have a contact uh, tracing app in Australia. And that's one of the advantage and one of the tools that helped us to uh, deal with pandemic and I guess uh, to a large extent we are grateful to this app and also many other things but uh, I thought okay let's let's analyze this and this app is available and then people can write reviews about this app and there are many concerns associated with this app one of them is privacy especially in Australia when you install this app, then, okay, they can track you. Maybe we don't want to send out your information or to what extent you send the information. So I, I got the reviews. I got the reviews from the users of this app in Australia, users of this app in Australia. And then I gave those reviews to my student. So basically, it's about more than 10,000 reviews. People have used the app and then they have written the reviews and then they have rated the app. Then I told my student, okay, now your task is to uh, basically analyze text and to find the relationship between the text feature and also the rating. So basically you need to show, you need to show those people who say this app is fantastic or they provide high rating, what has been in their text? What has been their emotion? They, did they talk about privacy? Did they talk about, I guess, uh, ethical issues? Basically they do text processing and I have taught them, I guess, uh, I'm not asking something really hard from them. I have taught them how to pro process text in my subject. And I, I should tell you, those students have come to my subject with zero knowledge of Python 
with zero knowledge of programming, they have come to my subject and I have taught them predictive analytics, uh, text mining, text processing, and now they are working on a real world project. And I have been monitoring where it work. They have come up with fantastic solution, fantastic model, and they are about to submit. So I guess our intention here is to first uh, make students familiar with what makes more sense. I'm not going to... Sorry, any question? Okay. Uh, so uh, to work with unstructured data as much as possible, that data set is real. It's, I guess it talks about a, an important phenomenon, an important issue. Nothing is right now more important than COVID for us. And there are lots of scientists around the world working on data set about uh, COVID. I guess uh, if even they can do very small, I guess, advancement in our knowledge from this COVID, it can be a big help. And that's the nature of knowledge. So basically, that's our approach to prepare a student for a real world data. So, sorry, I guess my screen, uh, okay. Uh, I, I cannot share my screen, I don't know what happened. Okay, can you try again, uh, Dr. Morteja? I think. Sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So basically, I provided example of what they have done. Basically, we teach them, okay, how to create a word cloud, how to clean text. For example, this word cloud that you can see in the right side of the screen, it shows in these 10,000 reviews, what are the words that are mainly mentioned by people? For example, download, contact, trace, Australia, steal. And they need to work on that more and more, get rid of the stop word, get rid of the repetitive word, which are irrelevant to the context. And this is not the end result. So they work on this word cloud, they create topics. And I have, for example, showed the topic here. I don't know if I, yeah, doesn't work. They have created, for example, the topic that people talk about, and those are advanced text processing techniques to develop different topics. And I mean, those techniques and those results need to be improved. But imagine that one student comes to a class with, with no technical background, and at the end, they can process the text, they can generate this uh, interface, they can create topics from text, they can create word cloud, they can use text for predictive modeling. This is fantastic. I'm not saying that you can do that only in my class in only in University of Queensland. Of course, we try our best to be the best, but what I tell my student, I learned everything in my life, not everything, most of the thing by myself, I guess it depends. But of course, universities like University of Queensland, we try to provide you the cutting edge knowledge about text analytics, about uh, business analytics, and we try to facilitate your learning. And this is our objective. I haven't seen any, any, text, any business analytics program which is as updated as us. I have been working in three universities and what we are doing in the University of Queensland in terms of the tools, techniques, and the overall structure of the course is really, really unique. And um, yeah. Uh, that, that's the feedback also that we get from the students. So uh, what we can do, I guess, uh, I, I have a few tips for my students. Usually uh, when we start the course, I say, okay, we have everything for you guys, but also you need, to, you need to start as soon as possible. Again, the beauty of 
predictive analytics, pre beauty of machine learning is that the resources for you are enormous. You just need to be active researcher to start. And one of the things that you can do, learn on the jobs, try to Google jobs, jobs that you think are, are for example, in Australia, it can be from Indonesia or from, I don't know, Europe, from everywhere else. But you can see what is on demand for industry. So of course, attitude is the most important thing. You need to uh, like working with data. And if you have that attitude, if you like the challenge, if you like uh, improvement and continuous learning, that's the best thing. Uh, I mean, those are the typical things for any, any learning program. Luck is, not a, is, is against me or others are small. Those are not really, really, um, I guess, big issues. It's your attitude. And what I encourage you to, um, to try to see what is available for you, which is accessible at the moment. Even if you want to start business analytics in Indonesia or in UQ or anywhere else, don't wait for you to enroll in the course. There are lots of competitions, Kaggle, Datatone, there are lots of resources. Just put it in YouTube. So you see that, you see that uh, many resources are there. My first advice, start as soon as possible. Then what I encourage my student, and I mentioned in the last slide, and this is absolutely important, to, uh, to look at what industry needs before you finish your study. My student usually, um, my, my my subject is advanced subject. So usually a student in the last year take my subject. But last year I used to teach one subject which was uh, foundation subject two. So it's good. And I used to tell my student, uh, try to have a plan for yourself. Try to from the first day to think what type of role you want to take. If you, for example, think you want to be a data scientist and you want to work in Australia, then jump online and Google or go to seek.com, see what are the requirements for data scientists. And then look at what you know and what you learn in the university. Of course, university uh, doesn't teach you everything. I mean, because it's not feasible because uh, we have many different roles. We have many different requirements. We give you the foundation, but you need to be able to build on top of that. So then if you don't know something, you learn it. And there are lots of online courses, project, internship. And right now podcasts are there and I provide a list of podcasts that are available for you. Networks are really important. Uh, in Australia, we have lots of meetups. We have university club. We have great mentors. I'm sure in Indonesia, you have those networking opportunities too. So I encourage you to uh, use that networking opportunities. So, yeah. Where are students head to? Uh, I guess in Australia, we have corporates, we have startups. They have two different setups. Usually for corporates, they allow our graduates to have more learning and training. They are more patient. They don't take too much, uh, take it easy to students. And usually they don't ask for really work experience. They look at top students that they can show they are, uh, coming with really, really good attitude, with talent, also with, I guess, good transcripts. That's what a corporate needs. But on the other hand, we have a startup. A startups uh, basically usually don't have enough money to spend on your training. So they want something ready to use. If you want to get a job in a startup, 
you need to build your portfolio in business analytics. So of course, there are more opportunities available in startups. Um, and if everyone wants to target corporates, you may need to wait or also you may not be successful at, at the end. So the beauty of business analytics is you can create your portfolio. Even, for example, using those competition like Kaggle, you can show that even if you haven't worked somewhere, but you have done something really fantastic in Kaggle, or you have done a project with your university professor. That's, that's my approach at the moment. I try to pick up my top student and I try to help them to publish a paper. And uh, the beauty is that uh, business analytics is somehow uh, one of the courses that university and industry are very close together. For example, if you think about engineering or some other, um, I guess, majors, there is a gap. But here, because the nature of what we do is, in university is um, very close to what industry is doing for business analytics. I guess this is uh, a very good area for you to create your portfolio with working with your university professor to show that you have done some research, some data analytics projects. And I'm sure if the recruiter, if the HR or hiring manager knows about analytics, they, they would definitely value because we usually have this loop for, for, for getting a job, you need work experience and for a work experience, you need to have a job. So, you know, uh, you never know uh, how you need to resolve this issue. I guess that's one of the tips that I can give you. You can show that you have some experience without having a job with those competition and also working with uh, research project or something like that. The position that our graduates are taking uh, are really, really different. So we can start with data analysis, which, is, which has lowest level of technicality. And then we can have the data engineer, data science scientist, and machine learning engineer. Two weeks ago, I had an industry lecture in my subject for my student. And guess what? This industry lecturer, three years ago, was my student at Deakin University, and he had no technical background. Three years ago, he got the job in ANZ, one of the major banks in Australia. And right now, he is a machine learning engineer. Yeah, he has been talented, he has been hard worker, but I guess no background in computer science wasn't an issue, only the attitude. He had the best attitude and he was an Australian. He was an international student without permanent residency on a student visa, okay? On a student visa, he had the best attitude. He worked, I remember the days that he used to call, come to my office, email me. And now after three, three years, he comes to my class and talks to my student as industry lecturer. How good is that? The opportunity is there. And the future is for those who take those opportunities and understand the importance of data. So at the end, I guess um, my advice is to use the resources that you have. Meetups in Indonesia, I'm not too sure how active are the meetups. Uh, that's one thing, but even not, we have lots of podcasts on uh, analytics. You can listen to them, them freely. Books, of course, and those books that come with podcasts, YouTube challenge, uh, channel, and also uh, it's important to uh, follow the influencers. Um, that's that's uh, very important. Uh, I have put some of the inf influencers that we have in Australia, and some of them are not Australian. Uh, those, I guess, resources doesn't take too much time. 
And even, for example, podcasts, you can listen to podcasts when you are driving your car or you are in the public transport, but it helps you to keep updated. And yeah, I guess uh, that's how I see uh, analytics, how we work with analytics, how we teach our students. And at the end, everyone is looking for data. So, and they are looking for people who can work with data. So yeah, I'm, I'm open to question. Um, uh, I tried not to have a lengthy uh, presentation. I myself get tired when, when it goes more than one hour. So I'm, I'm happy to sit and answer the question if you have any questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morteza, for uh, the lecture. It is really nice and interesting lecture. And thank you for encouraging my students to be a business analyst, data analyst, and even you told about your students' experience to be the machine learning optimizer, which is really interesting. So yeah, uh, we have two students here. I think first uh, Ali Sultan. Uh, so can you open your camera and ask directly to Dr. Mordeza? Uh, okay. Is my son is heard or not? Yeah. Yes, Ali. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, okay. My name is Ali. I'm one of final year students at this this business school. Uh, so. Uh, my question is about the issue in the text analytics. So especially in the text analytics, because I think that uh, compared to like numeric analytics, uh, numeric is, is like it uh, structured, but in text is not structured. It's like uh, in numeric, it's like one is always one and time is always 10. But uh, in text analytics, it's that like uh, when people say yes, it either literally yes or uh, it can like like a satire. So uh, they like uh, mocking uh, when they give a review to certain products, they say yes, but they don't like the product. And also like there are other issues like language barrier in text analytics. So uh, my question is that, um, uh, could you explain uh, some of several issue in text analytics and how you can overcome the and solve the issue? Yeah. Yeah, Ali, yeah, very, very good point. Look, uh, when we talk about unstructured data, we, we understand that uh, we, we have lots of difficulties, I guess. When we talk about sentiment, as, as you said, I guess, uh, the, the point about language, and for, for example, let's say people said, I'm not too bad. So I'm not too bad. Uh, if, if, if you, you compare word by word, it should have, I guess, a negative sentiment, but I'm not too bad, it's considered as good. So uh, basically we have many techniques. I, and again, in Python, we have many packages to deal with those issues. But at the end, there is a still room for improvement. And still, we cannot say that we have really robust techniques uh, to work with text data. Uh, which is good, I guess, which is good. Uh, and remember, even when we work with numerical, numerical data, our models are not 100% accurate. Um, and that's what also we teach, try to teach our students. Uh, business analytics uh, should be used with lots of coaches, especially when it goes to decision making and also ethics and I guess many other aspects. We need to understand for which type of decision we use our analysis. Let's say, for example, we use data for fraud detection, okay? Then the algorithm says, okay, Mori is suspicious to fraud. Do you send the police to uh, I guess uh, send him more to behind the jail because the algorithm has said no, because that's an important decision. But let's say I want to analyze text and send you a recommendation. Okay, my algorithm detected that your review, for example, has negative, I guess, sentiment and you, you like one aspect of the product and based on that, I'm sending you a recommendation. But at the end, the algorithm was wrong. Is the big deal? 
Probably not. If out of 100 of recommendation, 70 of them are all right, then we are happy. So basically, uh, one of the things that we try to teach our students to understand when and how they can use the algorithm for which type of decision. Of course, for unstructured data, we have lots of things to do. And look, uh, we need to understand that it, it, it is a never ending story. You know why? Because even if we solve the problem with the current data, the new sources of data are coming. So we need to change the mindset and, and understand that predictive analytics works to some extent and try to use the result for the right application. Thanks for your question. Okay, well, it is really a nice question, Ali. Uh, is that answer your questions or you have some uh, feedback on that? Yes, uh, thank you for the answer. No. Okay, well, thank you. And then next, uh, okay, so another students, maybe you have a question. Okay, Nathaniel, you have a questions again, okay. okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity again. Uh, some articles said that data scientist is the sexiest job of uh, 21st century. And some said that data scientist is not the, is not the sexiest job anymore. And data engineer is the new sexiest job of 20th century. Okay, uh, I have three questions about that. First, what makes them the sexiest job besides the rapid development of big data? Second, what, what's the main difference between data scientists and data engineer? And third, for us, business students, what do we need to take? The path of data scientists or the path of data engineers? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I will start with saying that uh, the sexiest job is the one that you like. Uh, Look, uh, I have this debate with many of my colleagues and they try to say, okay, data analytics, data scientists is very, I'm saying, no. I'm saying, okay, that's, that's a new role. It's on demand right now. So, and even as I said in my lecture and my presentation, I'm, I'm against the word data scientist. I, I don't think that's a right word. So I, I try to set the ex expectation low. I, 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 what I'm saying, the job opportunities are good at the moment, I guess. But also, uh, to be realistic, in the future, there is a possibility that in, let's say, 10 years, uh, data analytics are absorbed, the major is absorbed by other majors. But by other, for example, uh, modern majors like marketing, okay? Because by the time new, tech, new tools comes and people gain the knowledge and skills and maybe we don't need people specialized in data. We need people who are specialized on other fields, but they know how to work with data. So that's it. Uh, because I, I'm not supporting that fact, uh, I cannot uh, defend it, that data scientist is the sexiest. Um, my experience says, okay, what you enjoy is the sexiest because when you enjoy, enjoy a, a job, you will do your best and you will get promoted, you will be, you, you learn you enjoy, and I guess that's everything. Um, in terms of job market, what I can say, uh, for many reasons that I mentioned in my presentation, the job market is fantastic. At the moment in Australia, at least, the job market is fantastic. And I have seen few people that had their skill set and couldn't get a job, or uh, the process of um, job seeking was, I guess, um, lengthy, usually, they get the job. About uh, data engineer, again, that's, uh, we get those terminologies every day and those new, uh, new rules come up. Uh, usually they say, okay, data scientist is highly, highly technical person who can 
do advanced analytics techniques, do a little bit of programming and data engineer sits between data analysts and data scientists and prepare some of data for data scientists. So that's how the skill set is uh, basically distinguished. But if we have it truly, maybe not. And I have seen that in many job advertisements, they say, for example, data analysts, what they ask is data scientists. And I have, I, I see many job description for data scientists and they, they, what they ask is business analysts. I mean, uh, it really, really depends. And uh, let me tell you an experience. Uh, it, it's, it's very, it, it's very funny because it happened to one of my students. One of the students, I, I was his referee, and usually with my top student, I try to support them as much as I can. And he said I had an interview for data scientists. And it was yesterday, yesterday or the day before yesterday. He said in the interview, a very famous company in Australia, I, I don't want to name the name because of the privacy. The famous company in Australia, at, at least I can say it was in automobile uh, company. It's not Australian, it's overseas, but their headquarter in Australia. Uh, they, the interview was over Zoom, and then uh, this graduate, the poor graduate, was invited to interview. And in the start of the interview for data scientist job, they asked him to remotely work with a Excel a spreadsheet. Okay, for example, they said, "Okay, we want to do something with Excel. Can you tell us what should we should do?" And he hadn't, he didn't have control over that. So, and he was so frustrated and I said, okay, um, the problem is that those people who hire usually don't fully understand those terminologies themselves. Because of that, my suggestion is that when you want to apply for a role or uh, you want to consider, mainly look at the duties rather than job title, what they ask, and what is desirable, that's the most important, rather than job title itself. You had one more question. You had three questions. I, I forgot the third one. Uh, the third one is, for us business students, what do we need to take? Uh, the path of data scientist or the path of data engineer? Yeah, I guess my, 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 uh, suggestion is to create both skill sets because especially I guess data, data scientist jobs are not that much at the moment in Australia, at least in Australia, I don't know Indonesia, it's better, it's better to have data engineer skill sets too. So you create more opportunities for yourself. As I said, I have seen many, many, many graduates have got data scientist roles. And when they started working, uh, they mainly worked as data analyst or data engineer, what they asked. I guess, yeah, my, my suggestion is to definitely try to build up some skills for data engineer. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Morteza. So, is there any questions from the other students? Nathanel, you have some uh, feedback or some concerns that you want to ask again? Uh, actually, I have one more question regarding the uh, the text analytics. Uh, the, uh, the presentation you give is about app review. Uh, and app review are related to fake review. So how do you distinguish the fake review and the genuine review? Do we need to develop a new model or there, there is some other method to distinguish the fake review and the genuine review? Yeah, 
actually that's one of the areas of my research that fake reviews uh, I, I don't think I don't think in industry people are are in that level to look at the reviews that in depth because even in the academic paper I guess there are many debates on fake reviews I tell you what I'm doing my research I'm I have developed some methods to uh, detect uh, reviews that are, I guess, suspicious to be fake based on their order and their rating. So basically, we have some self-selection bias. It, that's some theories in marketing. Uh, basically, the common trend is not right now that, for example, when you release a product, then you may ask some of the friends or family that, okay, buy the product and rate it high. And what we do, uh, we try to detect the reviews uh, or analyze the review based on their order and their rating together. And also create some metrics for similarities and dissimilarities between the reviews. But I guess that's that's very complex. I'm pretty sure in industry they don't get in that level. They just trust the reviews as it is. And yeah, and if something is fake, usually it's from the company itself. So basically, there are some incentives or something like that to, I guess, to to get those supporting reviews. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Morteza, for the answer. Maybe another students have uh, questions regarding the lecture. Okay, while we are waiting for the students, maybe they are still thinking about the question. I actually have a question, uh, Dr. Morteza. So regarding Maybe this is uh, seems like uh, out of our topic discussions today, but I don't know it's still related or not because I've read your profile and then one of your research interests there is a blog about the blockchain technologies, of course, uh, because my previous thesis when I took my master degree is about the black blockchain technologies. So, but I still like uh, don't find any like uh, connection between. Uh, current development of blockchain technologies because right now I see like in Indonesia it seems like uh, a lot of companies want to implement it but one, when they know about how much they need to pay about the architecture of blockchain technologies they think it's too expensive and then they just leave it so in your opinion uh, how this technology will be developed in the future uh, is that any cutting any other cutting edge technology that will replace the technology? Because I, I've I've read a lot of research in this uh, technology and seems it seems like okay, so this still something uh, I said maybe this is stuck or this technology can be developed more. Thank you. No, the, the blockchain is going to be can be uh, the next revolution basically. The decentralized feature of blockchain, I guess, that's absolutely amazing. Uh, but I guess the only thing that we need to wait uh, is, I guess the concept is amazing, but it's only the feasibility and implementation. If at the same time, the blockchain is really, really very pushed by government and we need to see, okay, if our, our politicians want it or not, I guess. Uh, there are many factors. One is implementation and I guess the technology. The idea is fantastic. If, if we say, okay, blockchain as a concept, not, not as a technology, as a concept, uh, then let's say if we can implement it in, in um, different contexts, and then it goes to very much what our politician wants and if those uh, decentralized data system is in their favor or many things that comes up 
And if we, for example, take, uh, let's say, a cryptocurrency as an example, then you see with one tweet from Elon Musk, uh, the, uh, the price goes 20K more or less. So uh, because the nature, uh, I guess the future is much more dependent to uh, the policies and also regulation than the technology. That's what I think. And uh, let's say, I guess in 2018, when uh, UK uh, provided, uh, put some ban on cryptocurrency, then if you remember, uh, the Bitcoin price dropped to four Ks from, from 19 Ks, it dropped to four Ks in 2018. And now again, when one company says, okay, I'm going to accept it, and then it goes up. And I guess it's much influenced by that, but uh, definitely you know about blockchain, the, the concepts and uh, I guess what can be done with that is absolutely amazing. Um, and if we, yeah, we, we have nice regulation around it, then definitely that's the future. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Mordeza. It is really a nice answer. Yeah, of course, like um, when I saw like several consultants, companies, several companies that create a blockchain, they usually just sell the concept. Yeah, uh, and then the company uh, is interesting to buy it, to try it, but uh, when they know this is technology actually still in mature phase and then they decide to leave it. So any other students who have questions? Okay, uh, Ms. Nabila. Okay, so this is also my college as a lecturer in this department, Doctor. Okay, thank you, Papa Is, for um, giving me a chance. So good afternoon, Dr. Marteza. Uh, my name is Nabila. Hi, Nabila. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I've been interested in learning about marketing analytics and I'm currently um, taking an online course in programming fundamentals. Yeah, it's about uh, Python. Oh uh, yeah. So actually, I want to know like uh, what are the best ways of uh, you know like learning Python for marketing analytics and um, like because sometimes I feel like because I don't I didn't have any knowledge about that programming or coding. Yeah, before like I don't I didn't have any um, background on that. So. Uh, sometimes I will like, is it um, what I'm doing right now? It's the right track. I, am I on the right track or not? And maybe you have uh, any suggestions for us or for those who just started learning about data analytics or programming yeah, from the scratch. Like, yeah, in case you have uh, any, you know, like recommendation for us or suggestion. So thank you, yeah. doctor. No, thanks, Namila. Very nice to meet you, Namila. Uh, it's great. Uh, I guess for uh, Python, uh, definitely programming background is helpful, but I guess um, there is no must for that. Um, I can introduce you a book uh, uh, that I I use it in my teaching, and I have gone through different books, and this one to me is sound the best. Uh, that's. That's why um, I, I usually recommend it. And I went through that. I, I can see that uh, there is no need for programming. Um, one thing that we need to consider is that um, if, for example, uh, let's say Python is an ocean, then when we want to work with data science, we usually, we need to consider that we are using learning Python for data science. So there are lots of other fabulous things that we can do with Python, but, but for data science, we don't need to learn all those difficulties. So basically um, we are very targeted, very sp specialized. And um, that said, if we can, for example, learn how to import data in Python and for example, how we can work with libraries in libraries like Pandas or NumPy. And then that's it. Then, then uh, when we develop different models in scikit-learn, when we learn one model, then all, all the models are copy paste. So basically, for example, if we do this century, then 
a neural network is just we rename it or support vector machine. So basically, my my advice is to, to learn Python if if you are learning for data science with with the resources that teach Python for data science, not Python as a programming language. So because it can be very vast. Okay. okay, thank you very much okay. for our No time. problem. If you wanted to know the name of the book, uh, I can show you here, it's in my uh, bookshelf, or I can email you if- Yeah, 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 yeah. sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I, I can quickly bring it here. <laughs> oh. That's very kind of you. No problem. Actually, a colleague of mine borrowed it from me a couple of months ago. I remember that she hasn't brought it back. <laughs> I need to. I need to ask for her. But uh, uh, let me, um, no, that, that's all right. I, I can uh, send the name of the books to you quickly. If... I guess uh, it's good because I, um, it might be useful to other students to So basically, for Python, uh, uh, Python, uh, uh, that, that's the name of the book. I put it in chat box. Uh, I, I wanted actually to put it in the slide. I I, I forgot that, that was one of the things that I was reminding myself not to forget, but at the end I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, doctor, for sharing this to us. No problem. Thank you, Nabil. Okay, well, that's amazing. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Nabila, for your questions. And for any other students, maybe you still have uh, questions? Okay. Okay, Padika, maybe you have any questions? Okay, thank you, uh, Pak Faiz, to give me opportunity to ask uh, Dr. Morteza. I think uh, data analysis or data mining is have uh, a big progress in the past 10 years. So uh, I do my undergraduate thesis about text mining from Twitter data, but I think it's very different today, but uh, what your prediction for the future development of uh, data mining and how much it will be changed from today or present? Thanks, Rodrika. Th thanks for the question. I guess um, uh, getting back to my initial point about uh, data mining, which I said it, it has been there for 30 years, um, we we try to get new terminologies, and I guess it has become a trend. We had data mining, and then people called it predictive analytics or business analytics, and now they call it AI. Uh, for those who are, are as old as me, and I, my background is computer science. Uh, when I was a bachelor student, we had a comp a course called. Uh, AI and natural language processing, and it was uh, early 2000. Uh, so the concept was there, but because we didn't have data, uh, there wasn't any attention to that subject. And I remember in the university when we were learning, uh, we were thinking, oh, why we are learning this rubbish? Because <laughs> nobody was using that. We were thinking that's very theoretical, but now everyone is interested. Uh, but the thing is, text mining somehow it's, or on a structured data analysis is in the heart of AI system at the moment. So, and because we try to automate, uh, but I should correct myself, machine learning is the heart of AI system. And that's the decision-making engine for AI system. 
But uh, as I answered the earlier question, uh, we, we have still lots of issues and your colleague uh, beautifully mentioned that we have lots of uh, issues with dealing with takes and we still have no answer or we don't have a robust method for dealing with that. So if we believe in those uh, limitations, then there is much work to do. Uh, I remember, um, for example, five years ago when, for example, at Apple introduced Siri and everyone was making joke of that. But now you see that Siri is working, actually. There's no joke about it because they improved the algorithm for text processing or uh, NLP. So um, I guess uh, there is a still uh, really, really uh, room for working on that and if we want machine to be able to talk to us then we need to analyze text because basically what when we talk to machine our voice is converted to text and then the text is analyzed so basically uh, then the voice converts to text and text is analyzed so basically again text is in the heart of NLP so basically, so if we imagine the whole uh, picture, then again, text processing is really important. Okay, thank you, Dr. Martisha. No problem, thank you for your question. Okay, uh, thank you for the questions, Padika. So since we are getting closer to 12, maybe last questions from the students. So I over last chance to all of you. Maybe you have uh, any questions? Okay. Um, it seems they are already uh, now more, I hope, <laughs> regarding this lecture. So thank you, Dr. Morteza. Mm -hmm. So I think this is uh, we can end up this lecture. And then maybe you have, uh, before we end this lecture, maybe you have a closing statement. Yeah, uh, I want to thank you all. Uh, it's really amazing to see that large number of attendance and that engaging and really interesting questions. As I said, uh, my, always my best student have been international student. I, I see that there are lots of talents uh, from Indonesia and other overseas country. And I hope, um, I guess, uh, if business analytics is your interest, you find your way to do this course here or in Indonesia, but it has been a pleasure and honor to talk to you guys. And thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Morteza. And then, so we have uh, some, yeah, virtual thank you to you. Maybe uh, the community, can you show the small appreciation from me, from us, okay? Uh, Dr. Morza, could you stop your screen first? I'm sorry. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah, yeah okay. So oh, that's actually a uh, small, <laughs> oh, small, yeah. We, we, we can send this uh, certificate later to your email. So thank you. thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morteza, for your time. Thank you also for my and uh, Laura. Uh, are you still here? <laughs> I don't know uh, if, if she already left uh, this room. So thank you very much, uh, students, for you. this lecture. Yeah, I hope uh, this uh, will be a, a good start for all of you to be the data scientists later when you finish your study. Uh, okay, so yeah, before we end up this session, maybe we can take a photo together. Yeah, so maybe students, if you can turn on the camera, you can turn the camera on first. And then please, uh, the committee, uh, you can uh, take the picture for all of us. Okay, so they are still turning on the camera. Okay, yeah, I see a lot of virtual background here. <laughs> thank, thank you, everyone. 
And I forgot to say thank you to Mike that she has been behind all those things happening. And thanks so much, Mike, for your effort to make this happen. Okay, maybe I will. My pleasure. Thank you so much to our friends at ITS. It's been uh, wonderful to be able to continue our work together. And, and thank you, Dr. Nambar, for your hard work in pulling this seminar together. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Okay, so uh, can committee start to count in maybe? Okay. So we can smile. <laughs> okay, then I will start to take a photo. Or slide one, one, two, three, and then slide two, one, two, three, and then the next slide, slide three, one, two, three, and then for the fourth slide. One, two, three. And for the last slide. One, two, three. Okay, I think I already take some photo for all of us. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, it is really nice to have you here, Dr. Morte Zanamfar, and it is really nice also for having all students here. We hope this will be a good starting point for us to make the collaboration better in the future. And we hope like, um, yeah, in the future, of course, we are waiting you to come physically to here in ITS. And you will really love Indonesian food. <laughs> I promise. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have tried it here. Yeah, de definitely. Okay, I'm looking yeah. forward to visit Indonesia. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Okay. So thank you very much. Then uh, we can end up this meeting. So, okay. So good afternoon, uh, students. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.